Carol and Josh and Peter and Leo uh, for having me to here tonight. And uh, I'm going to try uh, my best to be interesting about a topic that usually makes people's eyes glaze over, which is I think when you, even New Yorkers, I think when they hear about state government, they bristle a little bit, right? It's not, it doesn't give enough to the city, or it's, it's too onerous in its requirements, and so forth. So uh, the new book, um, which is on how states shape post-war America, you'll see that, and I'm going to use tonight uh, the example of Nelson Rockefeller's uh, era of governorship uh, as a primary example of a kind of new role for states in post-war America. But the book itself, and we do have copies here, um, uh, also treats other states uh, and basically relates this post-war, this, this tremendous change in the United States, I think, that took place after World War II, where states, which really had been at the margins, uh, mostly in terms of uh, the legal, uh, they basically provide the legal basis for the existence of cities and much of their powers, but they really take a much more uh, aggressive role. So I've got 57 slides and 45 minutes. <laughs> so uh, why do states get involved? States get involved because they, the city is changing in the post-war period. It's going from basically being something contained really within the sort of the boundaries of sort of city boundaries, municipal lines, to being a metropolitan scale, regional scale entity. Uh, and as a result, uh, the problems uh, really crossed um, jurisdictional lines, if you will, right? They crossed from cities to suburbs, and a lot of the new problems of the new uh, decentralizing metropolis <coughs> were to be addressed. So out in the suburbs, uh, you, while well, you know, we sort of see this as a golden age, right, of suburbia, mean, there are already a lot of identified problems. Environmental decline, the baby boom, the overwhelming pressure on K through 12, and also higher education, which was coming in the 60s, a kind of commercialism that didn't really have a kind of civic dimension to it, traffic congestion um, in New York, but in other states like Chicago, also commuter rail decline was an issue for suburbs, uh, and then race and class discrimination. So the suburbs were, you know, we usually think of suburbs as you know, this sort of golden place in the post-war era. I should say urban historians don't so much, but I think the public does. Uh, yet yeah, there were widespread identified problems. Then urban centers, right? They had uh, some similar problems with their own unique issues. Traffic congestion being one thing that had been identified. Declining mass transit, surface transit, but also rapid transit in this period. A massive flight of people, businesses, uh, energy to the suburbs. Uh, substandard housing in large amounts and racial segregation within the city itself. So these were, um, there were problems that were basically besetting both cities and suburbs and some of these things as you can see here like mass transit, these were a lot of things that crossed city and suburban lines. Um, so, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, yeah, sorry. So, um, it's really states come in in this post-war period around metropolitan scale issues, and that's, that's the real change here. Now, um, the, the italics on the legal there, they had already, states were already deeply involved in uh, urban affairs. And for those, um, for my students primarily, uh, state, uh, cities are creatures of states. They can only do things that states tell them they can do. Uh, there was already, that tradition is basically very old in the United States, but what we see different uh, in this uh, post-war period is a, a really a, a, an unprecedented role of states in planning uh, for various dimensions of urban affairs, financing certain urban aspects of urban affairs, and the asterisk there is just for all of you, uh, there's also the federal government is a kind of becomes a really important pass-through, and I'm not going to talk about it a lot, but it's really crucial. So. Uh, development of various forms of infrastructure and even management, day-to-day -day management of urban systems. So uh, we'll be talking about Nelson Rockefeller. I call him America's urbanist governor. And he certainly was the most outspoken person in the 1960s on urban affairs and what state governments could basically do for uh, urban policy. Um, a little star there, or the asterisk again. There are a lot of governors in my book. I'm not going to focus on all of them. But there are many uh, activist governors of this post-war period. Um, and yet, I think because, for instance, where we are in Battery Park City, which is more or less a kind of creature of Nelson Rockefeller and his revision for Lower Manhattan and his brother, David Rockefeller, will focus on uh, his, uh, his contribution. And then I'll, I'll, I'll veer off to sort of talk about other cities as well. So let's start with transportation, all right, and state government and transport. Now, highways, uh, this is actually in the literature of urban studies. It's well documented that state government played an enormous role in um, sort of creating the post-war uh, 
uh, interstate system and so forth. If you look at this map even, you'll see the national system. It's a national system of interstates, but it's the state highway officials who basically designed it. So because of our, sort of, of our federalist system, uh, basically the states were responsible for designing highways. Um, but the federal government by the 1950s becomes, particularly the late 50s, uh, becomes this massive force for funding uh, a new era of interstates. Um, so, because this is an area which has been talked about a lot in urban studies, I'm not going to go into great detail on it, except to say that obviously the highway programs which states pursued, which ran through cities, through city neighborhoods, uh, around cities, opened up new suburban areas, this was a truly um, a, a massive impact on urban development. And I recommend Owen Gutfriend's book if you're interested in this topic. And I have a, a relatively small section on highways. Nelson Rockefeller, big highway guy until he wasn't, until finally people stopped them, and then he was forced, after years and years of fighting, to try to keep them going, uh, to abandon a, a few of his highways. But he built a lot before he was done, and some of these, like in Buffalo, really had, and Syracuse and Rochester had <coughs> enormous impacts on urban areas, and not positive. But what was really unprecedented in the post-war period was the arrival of states and mass transit. Uh, and it was unprecedented because in the United States, until the post-war period, until the 1940s and 50s, almost all mass transit in the United States uh, was a private entity. I mean, there were some exceptions, like New York had taken over its subways uh, and so forth. But almost entirely in the United States, uh, transit was a uh, private entity. And even, for instance, our commuter rail systems were still private systems in this period. Um, so the idea of government kind of moving in and taking over mass transit was a radical, was a radical change in how uh, people looked at, um, uh, for instance, state government and cities. Um, now, Nelson Rockefeller was not somebody, even though it's, I, you'll read in the newspaper, people say like, oh, you know, Nelson Rockefeller grabbed mass transit in the city. No, he did not want mass transit. And he did everything he could to not run mass transit, despite the fact, you know, he, uh, there was enormous pressure on him. And so um, by the late 50s, early 60s, when he's governor, there are, um, you know, the, the systems are failing, right? They're failing at, in the private way. The commuter rail lines were still nominally privately run. They had gotten some, some public subsidies. But um, as you can see here, you know, old systems, uh, rundown stations, and he's forced into the transit industry. Uh, again, the state government comes into transit for this guy. Right? And who is this? This is their archetypal commuter, right? So the, before there was the MTA, there was the MCTA. That's the first word, the Metropolitan Commuter Transit Authority, right? Transportation Authority. And that matters because he voted, right? It's the suburbs voting, right? They're responsive. Again, this is the metropolitan scale. They're thinking about, you know, who votes in Long Island, for instance, right? Um, and so that's the Rockefeller Republican. Long Island is period very Republican. But they're riding trains into the city, right? So the, the state first comes in in 1965 into transit because the suburbs basically have a failing privately run commuter system. So he brings it. Um, now, in the years that followed in 65, then there was, there was still enormous pressure that the state provide a kind of equity for the city. So um, in 1968, you have basically the creation of the modern MTA as we know it as a kind of equity take over the subways, which were failing in their own way, but they were failing under public management by this point. Uh, and the key, of course, to this, and I won't go into the financing in great detail, but in essence, they took the bridges and tunnels uh, from Robert Moses, right, in a deal uh, to basically help fund the MTA, although that money did not arrive until the early 1970s and so the MTA will basically have to go upstate uh, to, um, I'm sorry, go to federal government for money, seek bond initiatives, etc. Uh, in the first years of the MTA, there was enormous optimism about what could be achieved on a regional scale, these visionary kinds of plans. The subway would be massively expanded. You'd have uh, basically the Long Island Railroad running down the um, uh, Long Island Expressway, a cred incredible midtown transit station. The 63rd Street Tunnel, it was built, but only half used for decades. Um, and then even airports were put under the MCTA in this period. So there's a lot of visionary work, almost none of which uh, was achieved. Uh, what was achieved uh, was significant, though. Without the state's intervention in, for instance, the commuter rail system, it would have collapsed entirely. All right? And then, because the commuter rail system uh, basically, it's a smaller, uh, it's easier to basically renovate than, let's say, our subway system. Uh, they were able to order hundreds of new cars, 
uh, improvements were made in stations and so forth. <coughs> it's relatively simple. So in essence, you could say that in the late 1960s and certainly the 70s, um, the, the, the new MTA, this uh, basically state authority, saves commuter rail for this area. And this was not uncommon in a few other cities like Philadelphia and elsewhere, where basically the state, uh, Massachusetts, where the, basically the state steps in to basically rescue the remnants of a private system. Um, the subway is more complicated, right? It was a bigger, it was much a, a larger thing to swallow, right? It was a much more complicated system with fiber stations, uh, and um, there was a labor, there were very complex labor issues, etc. Um, so new cars were ordered, they took much longer to arrive. You know, the subway is saved, I would argue, by the state in the 19, uh, late 60s and early 70s, but it was not perfected. I think we can say that with that name. And it wasn't until the 1980s, under the leadership of Richard Ravitch and others, uh, that they then used basically the bonding capacity of the state to borrow enormous funds of money to really renovate the system. Uh, and of course, that's another key element of the state, which sort of underwrites a lot of urban infrastructure here, is the ability to basically sell bonds against the, the, basically the state's credit uh, for urban infrastructure projects. And what's the proof that you know, this, this was a worthwhile investment for the state? Well, here are just some examples of you know, places, whether it's Lower Manhattan or Forest Hills, uh, the Queens, or uh, East Harlem or Scarsdale. Uh, these are areas across a, a vast metropolitan area that, in essence, without mass transit would have lost a lot of value. We would not be talking about adding a lot of housing to these areas because they would not have significant mass transit. Uh, so for all its imperfections, I think it's really sort of the, the key element to the development of, of the sort of continuing development of the city. If we look around the country, we will see state, basically, uh, uh, transit authorities uh, rise in this period, whether it's in Boston, um, Baltimore, and elsewhere. Uh, the key in a lot of these cases was uh, a kind of pre preservation of residual transit systems. Uh, for uh, basically urban areas, but there always was, very frequently was, a commuter dimension uh, to it. And most of them, what Nelson Rockefeller found out, uh, and all these other state authorities which were created, was that even the states didn't really have the money, or they didn't have the political will to build first class systems. And that's kind of the story. I have to tell you that how states shaped post-war America is not all about how they shaped it in this wonderful way. They, they also, a lot of the book is about limits. And one of the limits was that states don't have printing presses for money. So they were highly reliant on basically complex political deals, which we've seen today, um, and also debt. Uh, and I would feel a lot worse about the, uh, giving the, uh, the MTA a lot of credit for saving the subways had this congestion pricing thing not gone through. But I think it's another indication, right? It's, it's a very uh, hard battle, but uh, there are definitely advantages to having the state involved. Let's talk about urban and regional development. Um, so we'll focus on the urban side of it first. Um, states were early into what we call urban renewal, a very controversial topic. Uh, even before there was a federal urban renewal program, where basically states were getting involved in Pennsylvania. Um, and the Title I program, which came out of the Housing Act of 1949, built on that. Uh, basically that kind of partnership. And so there were basically federal uh, funds which flowed in for redeveloping urban centers. Uh, there were also state funds, as you can see here in New York. And there were about seven states that had uh, basically uh, urban renewal programs separate from the federal government. And the reason they had these programs was that the urban renewal program, the Title I program, wasn't very successful. Um, there were a lot of delays. There wasn't enough money even to basically, there wasn't enough developer interest very often to get these sites off the ground. That's partly why Robert Moses ran into trouble. Um, so the states stepping in to basically, these states that stepped in to underwrite <coughs> the uh, urban renewal, did so because there was increasingly less and less interest in redevelopment and there was also enormous resistance to it. And this was, became a very large program uh, in New York and I, I, the, the outcomes mixed. You know, in a lot of cases they bulldozed, especially upstate cities, large areas of cities in preparation for um, these urban renewal projects, and a lot of them did not come to fruition. So. Uh, one of the, you know, when we talk about the failure of the problems of urban renewal, one of the solutions which came out of that was the Urban Development Corporation, uh, 1968, which was Nelson Rockefeller's like, okay, we'll correct, you know, urban renewal with a more powerful, you know, uh, entity, right, which had the power to the domain, had enormous ability to borrow money, to plan, even develop a whole uh, sections of cities. This gives you a little sense of the spread of the various projects uh, which the UDC engaged in. 
And so you can see, you know, basically follows that kind of urban core um, of the state. Um, and uh, had the UDC not faced the enormous problems of uh, basically recession, inflation, and so forth, uh, it would have been even more successful. But uh, they, they had a big housing program, which I'm not going to talk about tonight, uh, but they actually did take on sort of redevelopment projects in cities like Syracuse and Rochester, where there really wasn't much market interest in these places anymore, but they thought there was an opportunity to basically create modern office buildings that would attract people downtown. Uh, they also, uh, the UDC was also drawn into the Roosevelt Island project, all right, and basically a separate uh, authority is basically created to react to, to basically uh, manage that development project, which definitely stalled out in the 1970s, but has become <coughs> tremendously successful uh, today. Um, a sort of spin-off of these various uh, urban renewal type projects, or as another one, is the Battery Park City project, where we are today. Right? Again, another one that was started in the 60s, a lot of political battles over what it would be, uh, stalls out in the 1970s and then really catches fire, certainly in the 1980s and really the 90s, uh, as a development. And it basically has its own, as most of you know, uh, has its own uh, basically management uh, separate from uh, the city uh, in terms of its, uh, its codes and so forth. Now the UDC, uh, basically, as a housing developer, collapses in about 1975, but it has a new life. Because, basically, um, after Rockefeller's gone in 73, you know, the governors weren't willing to, and also, I think, the state legislature, they're not going to give up something that has that tremendous power. And the UDC would play a very important role in a variety of different redevelopment projects. Uh, it has the ability to, basically, circumvent local zoning. Again, a domain is something. It has a lot of different power. Um, and so UDC is eventually merged into what we call the Empire State Development Corporation, which you've heard a great deal about. Uh, people were very surprised to hear the state, you know, you know, it was like, what's the state doing? And of course, the state's been involved in all kinds of different big projects, Atlantic Yards, the Manhattanville Project of Columbia, all over the place. Uh, Hudson Yards, uh, City Lab just showed how the uh, ESDC played an important role in moving around, uh, basically, uh, uh, the EB-5 credits. Uh, to help the Hudson Yards happen, or upstate, a lot of the urban planning that's happening is related to the Empire State Development Corporation. So that's had a, a much longer life. We kind of think of the UDC as sort of going away, but all the powers that are created, they, they stick around, and that's typical of these state agencies. Um, and we did these maps, uh, Mina Nanova, who's a great GIS uh, person, uh, we did these maps of some other downtowns, just to give you a little sense that it's not just New York. Yeah, New York's a, a really kind of classic case study of all this. Uh, but you can see this is downtown Baltimore, right here. This is a little part of Chicago. And you can see through all these, you know, the, the, these all have the fingerprints of various state agencies, authorities, and so forth. You know, with the stadiums, the convention centers, highways, mass transit, um, redevelopment authorities, uh, center city state universities. And when you start adding it up, like mapping it out, you know, you can see that a city like Baltimore, but there are many cities that have this kind of imprint of the state government. Right? It, has, it tends to have a very powerful impact in many different cities. And most of these basically date from the post-war period and this idea that states would play a bigger role in downtown redevelopment. Briefly, however, it's not just states impacting big cities in their respective states, but also their capital cities. Right? Now, we often think of you know, there's often this idea, well, you know, yeah, it's crazy, the, the Albany, the Nelson Rockefeller Plaza, I mean, it's an extreme, right? It's definitely extreme of, you know, the redevelopment of a, um, a center city in the service of, of course, Nelson Rockefeller's ego, but also in the service of state government, right? This kind of emerging large-scale bureaucracy. And, uh, you know, you can see here the highway coming in, uh, the massive podium being constructed uh, for what becomes... Uh, the capital office complex. Uh, but the truth is, if you, so when I started looking around the country a little bit, you know, I thought, well, you know, this really doesn't fit in with this idea of how states, because it seems to be this sort of one-off. But when you start looking around the United States, uh, what you see is that every, pretty much, well, not every, but almost all state capitals, because of this large and growing responsibility of state government, in many areas of life, not just urban affairs, they need more space, right? You need these, there are all these bureaucratic demands I right, more more workers, but where are we going to put them? <clears throat> so from Austin to Sacramento, you see it, you can't really see it too well, but these have the different dates of buildings. 
But when you start putting them all together, right, these are transformative projects, often with the goal of changing, let's say, downtown Sacramento. That was sort of, you know, the goal was to change it. Uh, this is Tallahassee in Florida, right, and Edward Burrell Stone. So there is this, um, just the simple expansion of the scale of state government itself creates opportunities, and the states are powerful, right? They have this power over uh, local government, and so in capital after capital, you have this kind of redevelopment going on. Higher education. So, there was enormous pressure in the post-war period to basically meet the educational demands of um, the rising uh, baby boom generation, but also the, the GIs returning home. These were met in a variety of different ways, um, but certainly uh, the, there's a mass expansion in K-12 through education. I don't have a chapter on this. You'll see in the book, I have a chapter on a lot of different topics. Um, but uh, for instance, New York State paid for the, a large portion of the new K-12 through buildings in suburbs, and they actually had a kind of um, standardized school building that they kind of sent out. You've seen them all across New York State. So they played an important role there in kind of helping suburbs grow. <coughs> but the next question was, well, what about you know, these uh, sort of the emerging uh, young people of this baby boom generation? The suburbs they were moving were pretty limited in terms of civic infrastructure, right? You know, shopping malls and some things like that. But if you look at Long Island, for instance, there were just a few small private institutions. Uh, and the question was, you know, who would basically offer and sort of develop this uh, new system for them? And also, or I should say educational opportunities for them, and also at the same time, a lot of this had to do with providing a kind of civic infrastructure for the suburbs. You often see with these new campuses they built like, auditoriums, right? things like that, art galleries. And this is very conscious on their part, right? Because their goal is to basically create um, a kind of new, and they're, they're very open about this in Rockefeller and others, um, uh, they're very clear that they're creating a new kind of work, right, for a technological society. Right? And that the educational institutions as they existed really didn't deliver that. Uh, so they were going to create a whole new system. Um, and uh, here is the University of Albany, I believe they call it now, or SUNY Albany. So uh, SUNY had basically been created in about 48 out of a kind of combination of old uh, normal schools or teaching colleges. Uh, and it really wasn't much of a presence uh, in New York State. New York State was dominated in sort of the same way mass transit had been, right, by private entities. It was a privately driven system. Um, and yet, this private system didn't expand uh, for a variety of reasons to basically take on the challenge of all these kids being pumped out of the K-12 through system. Uh, so Rockefeller basically, he hires one of his many commissions, uh, and they basically uh, put forward a, a basically a region, a sort of regional plan. And one of the characteristics of a lot of the major campuses <coughs> which were created, you can see on this slide. Right? Um, um, while there were a lot of small town normal schools which became uh, new SUNY schools, it's a lot of the mega campuses, Buffalo, this one, uh, Albany, and also um, Stony Brook. Now these are built out in the suburbs, right? Intentional, right? They're basically to meet the demands of this rising generation of students, they're connected to the region not with mass transit, which is a god-awful mass from, you know, getting to go, right, but with highways, right? They're highway driven systems, they're enormous pieces of land, they're master planned, you know, Rockefeller and his crowd basically brought in all their favorite architects, whether it was Edward Durrell Stone or other people, to basically design these as um, these sort of new communities almost, is the way I kind of look at them, uh, in the suburbs. And they offer, usually offer a fair bit of also what we call civic infrastructure in terms of auditoriums, uh, public spaces, et cetera, in these emerging suburban areas. That didn't happen before. Uh, and of course, did a lot of interesting architectural experimentation. Um, the State University Construction Fund, somebody should just do a book on the State University Construction Fund. They really believed in bringing the best architecture to the smallest town or suburb or something like that. They really believed there was like an educational dimension to building these campuses in taste. Um, and so they built these beautiful places uh, all across the state, uh, particularly in the mega campuses, and they had this idea that the new architecture should um, uh, really be purpose built, didn't have to be beautiful in a sense, uh, and we live with that legacy uh, today. What's the impact? Well, you know, the impact is here is um, about, I think, mm, I don't know, 1950, and this is today. You can see the, the difference between um, educational achievement. Uh, in a state like New York, 
right? And you know, this, the, the much higher levels, I'm sorry if the slide's a little blurry, but the much higher levels of college grads in, on a regional basis is the result of the expansion of the public system. Uh, private's expanded a little bit, but basically the creation of these enormous systems, particularly surrounding, let's say, New York City, and Buffalo, Albany, et cetera, uh, was crucial. And we can see this all across the country, right? I mean, obviously, New York was based on the California model, right? But you can see Texas basically develops models like this. Um, Florida had a very aggressive program. North Carolina also had a very aggressive program of development of these types of, uh, particularly peripheral campuses, uh, being one of the goals. Again, sort of thinking about this kind of metropolitan or regional scale urbanization. And even eventually cities uh, become major recipients of this type of program. Uh, here we have Cleveland State, the University of Maryland, Baltimore. Um, oh, okay. Um, and uh, in these cases, the, the cities basically um, were sites for new um, state universities, which were established um, in order to basically, very often for professional schools, but they were also part of urban redevelopment schemes, and they were welcomed by city leaders. All right. And so, in almost every American city, one of these sort of these one or two or more of these anchor institutions are crucial uh, to uh, basically the, the vitality of a city like Cleveland. Take Cleveland State out, uh, and there would be a, even less vitality. Housing. Right, so I've got 15 minutes. Josh? 15. All right. I'll see what I can do. I'll, I'll turn my. So. Um, Obviously, this is an area I've written about a lot, talked about, so I will be relatively brief, but we really haven't seen since, uh, for instance, when we talk about Rockefeller, um, sort of the, the Mitchell Lama program really gets scaled up under his leadership. He doesn't create it, but he, he incentivizes it to the point that many people take us to it. And uh, particularly crucial in Mitchell Lama programs, these middle income programs were about, in New York, um, but to a limited extent, there was very little, very few imitators of this in this period. The whole idea was to um, anchor the middle class in New York City, to create a whole new environment for them that they would stay. Uh, and so subsidize, so subsidize the middle class so they would stay in the city. Uh, and this became a very large program in New York. Um, and interestingly enough, these Mitchell Lama projects, which you can see here in this neat map, they're not just in the sort of wealthier, darker areas in the city, but they were actually uh, and if you see the lighter areas are the poorer neighborhoods. Uh, many of them were designed to basically provide a kind of um, anchor for neighborhoods that were undergoing basically disinvestment. Uh, and it was really a, a kind of counter narrative to a lot of the disinvestment that happened uh, in the suburbs, for instance. Uh, it was a very costly program. I always like to point this out. The state took enormous <laughs> risk to what's called the Housing Finance Agency to pay for this stuff. Enormous uh, amounts of debt were taken out to pay for this housing on the expectation it would all pay back. You know. um, there were major problems in the 1970s around this housing, what could be done. In terms of impact, though, I mean, nobody has come close since that period to building a place like Co op City. Adam Tanaki here, I'd love to see you. Um, but you know, 15,000 apartments for middle income residents. Uh, this was truly a, a kind of it was unprecedented in scale, and particularly for a state government uh, to play that role. And even though the HFA, the Housing Finance uh, Party, had big problems, all right, um, it became something that other states looked at. They said, okay, we're not getting much money from the federal government for public housing, certainly not for middle income housing. 1973 Nexon cuts off the public housing programs. So, um, the basically states begin to look at this model of basically debt financing uh, through uh, for, for housing. And it would pick up, particularly in the 1980s, again with federal help uh, through various tax credit programs and so forth. But we have basically states, um, not just New York, New York, people looked at New York and sort of the model of Mitchell Lama, they saw a lot of its problems when basically the federal money or federal tax incentives and so forth were available. Uh, they began basically encouraging the development of what is really a mixed income model that New York had basically pioneered. You can see basically with the low income housing tax credit how a lot of these new subsidized projects are more dispersed on a regional scale than, for instance, public housing was uh, before. Fair housing, also an uh, important part for states. Uh, before the Fair Housing Act of uh, 1968, um, states are in fair housing, many states. 
uh, including New York. And um, it was uh, the... The fair housing laws, which were developed as early as the late 1930s in New York, at New York State, were expanded over the course of the 1940s, 50s, and into the 60s. Uh, and many of these laws um, had almost no effect. Right? Uh, they were not powerful laws. In many ways, there was enormous um, interest, both in the city and the state, in creating these laws, but they, they didn't really have much teeth to them. They didn't have teeth to them. Uh, one of the responses to the sort of lack of um, success with these types of programs uh, was, for instance, to try under Rockefeller's uh, administration to build subsidized housing in suburbs. Um, also not successful. Uh, and resisted, and this is Paul David Alton, who was one of the people who was basically pushing for uh, this kind of uh, social integration. So on this, in this respect, states were pioneering. They set the groundwork for basically federal action in 1968, uh, but they were not transformed. Mental health is another interesting uh, topic uh, related to states. Now, states uh, had played an enormous role in mental health. It basically dominated the field, particularly of institutionalization, uh, in the United States. Uh, and the solution which states, unfortunately, had come to by the post-war period was to develop these enormous farm schools where people were locked up uh, and basically treated with uh, various mood-controlling drugs. Now, uh, this was very rightly seen as a violation of very often people's rights, their health, uh, and so forth. There was enormous pressure for reform. Rockefeller was one of the reformers, but also there were other governors. Uh, California was a pioneering state in this as well, uh, basically deinstitutionalizing, closing these places down, uh, and moving people out into the community. There were lots of visionary plans for what community-based mental health would look like. Um, well. You know how it goes. Uh, <laughs> they promised a lot. They built some in some places, but mostly uh, they basically pushed people out uh, into uh, communities with insufficient, um, uh, insufficient support uh, and so forth. And you know, I, I wouldn't say it's obviously deinstitutionalization is not the sole source of the homeless crisis. There are many reasons: the loss of SROs in New York, single-room occupancy dwelling, you know, the general loss of affordability, and so forth. But the failure of states, basically, to uh, basically to, to shift from the the institutions, which were we have to admit were a form of housing, right? Terrible housing, but they were housing, right? To basically having very limited responsibility for people uh, is something that you know I wanted to make sure was in the book and was sort of addressed. Uh, but that contribution of states where they went for basically housing people to basically allowing for a permanent situation of homelessness. And of course, they basically dumped it on cities in this case. Finally, and my last uh, topic tonight, is environmental management and parks. Um, and states are I mean, relatively you know, re well recognized in these fields for their role in environmental quality. Um, now, in the post-war period, there were a lot of visionary plans for regional development. Uh, metropolitan scale development, you know, really beautiful renderings like this, like this is how New York would grow, right? Nice and tidy and urban there, with like these nice little cores, and you know, it's like, we'll preserve all the big green space and so forth. Um, sadly, um, the, this kind of regional planning, even though the states essentially kind of had the power, politically they could not exercise uh, the kind of power they wanted. And I've got a, a big section on regional planning. Obviously the urban growth machine, right? This kind of power of development was overwhelming uh, for first states to really implement these. Um, so, but then we do see a number of ways in which states uh, play an important role in, in moderating some of the environmental uh, problems uh, brought by this kind of metropolitan scale development. Uh, one is New York, uh, like California, there are other states as well engaged in this. Uh, we're pretty early to, um, we're, we're earlier um, in the kind of scale for the funds they had in the federal government. The Pure Water Program, Basically, to, you can see here where the, the gray areas are identified. Um, these are areas you know, near urban centers which have basically become extremely polluted. New York City obviously being one of the worst in terms of um, dumping. Uh, and so, um, in, in essence, bonds were sold you know, for uh, basically a massive scale cleanup, um, usually involving um, a water treatment, some source reduction, uh, but states definitely uh, took a lead role in this, and a lot of the uh, basically early 1970s Clean Water Act era, a lot of that was modeled 
on what had basically been developed in states, and I should add also a lot of the enforcement because of our federal system, uh, is still rest with state governments, uh, both good and bad. Um, also, uh, along this line of kind of seeing the cities as a region, right, in a metropolitan area, certainly the parks were a crucial element in regional park systems. And this, of course, had been started by Robert Moses um, on, a, on an unprecedented scale, uh, late 20s, 30s, 40s, um, and it continues into the 1960s, the expansion of parks, uh, particularly um, sort of opportunistic, a large scale, uh, um, old estates were picked up in the suburbs on Long Island, or along the Hudson River, uh, or near um, the various uh, cities upstate. Uh, and so this was really kind of, we, we can't do a green belt in the United States, and wouldn't that be nice, but, uh, except for Portland, but uh, my students. Right, but you know you can't really do a green belt. But if you buy enough, where you basically get hold of enough uh, park space, then it begins to have regional impacts potentially. Uh, and then even in New York City, while um, and New York City had benefited enormously from some of the state park work that Robert Moses had done, you know we can see that, uh, for instance, Roberto Clemente Park was kind of the the one piece of the vision that wasn't really realized yeah. of this kind of state park of the 1960s. It was really kind of a a push that New York City residents would have more access to state parks. You know, they, for instance, had a whole busing program bringing people out to the state <coughs> park. Um, but I said, well, why should they have to go out? Let's put state parks in the city. Um, and this was under uh, Nelson's brother, Lawrence Rockefeller. They do develop one. It's a very nice state park, um, the Roberto Clemente State Park. But um, again, money, funds, they don't achieve much of that vision. Since, of course, that period, we do have like the Hudson River Trust Park. Uh, system along the, the waterfront here, uh, showing what a kind of state uh, entity can do, basically develop a kind of ribbon park, you know, on a new kind of scale. Um, and of course, the biggest accomplishment, uh, certainly, I would say, of the sort of environmental and kind of thinking about parks as planning, uh, is the Adirondacks um, rezoning or zoning. Now, this was really revolutionary. It's a six million acre area. It's an enormous area. Um, Basically, before the Rockefeller era, there was a kind of line around the park. Um, there were the, basically the privately held lands and the publicly held lands. And there, was very, there were very few controls on this enormous area um, upstate, which was considered very beautiful. And uh, um, there, were enormous, there was enormous resistance to basically establishing stronger controls uh, on this area. Uh, but Rockefeller's team and a lot of environmentalists uh, succeeded in basically achieving a kind of rezoning or a zoning for this area, uh, including really pretty remarkable limits on um, land development in this area. And who are they doing it for? Well, it's pretty openly clear that the locals don't want this, right? Who are they doing it? They're doing it for people in Albany. They're doing it for you in Syracuse, the big consumers of this product for low in New York City as well, right? So basically, they're kind of reaching out again on this kind of metropolitan or regional scale. Right? Using the power of the state, and believe me, there have been enormous numbers of challenges uh, to uh, state, the state exercising control over local government, over development in this way. Um, but they've all stood up. Though, I mean, I should say the, the, the laws have stood and the challenges have <coughs> failed. But it turns out states are extraordinarily powerful in this area if they want to be. And I would end by just noting that um, New York was not alone in this area, uh, basically extending kind of the, the state government's control over like valuable public assets. Here's Tom McCall in Oregon, uh, the Beach Bill, um, basically a, a whole new sort of way of thinking about you know uh, public access uh, to a, a vital resource. And who are they really doing this for? Right. It's not the locals along the beaches or the California coastal. It's not, not for the locals, right? It's for these like massively booming, you know, suburbs, cities, and other people. They have the cars, the money. They want to go to these places, so they're guaranteeing access uh, for them. Wow. All right. Well, that was uh, I think five different topics. <coughs> uh, I hope that um, you get a little sense from this this talk that um, states really do matter in ways. Um, that we don't often talk about um, because um, they do operate very often um, in a legalistic manner, right? They're often the force behind regional authorities, right? A lot of what they did didn't work out, so, you know, that's also important. Or, for instance, had pretty negative consequences like the highway programs uh, or the um, or deinstitutionalization, 
So it's a complex legacy. But I would say that um, given you know, just what I've shown you here and what I have in the book, um, talking about cities and urban development and metropolitan areas doesn't make a lot of sense right, um, if you don't sort of take into account the role that states have played in shaping, particularly post-1945 in the United States. And I would end by just saying, you know, everyone in New York, you ask them, like, oh, just go to Long Island, people say, well, where do you want to live? They say, oh, North Carolina. There's no government there, or something like that. Like, they all want to move there, or something. But I have I end the book on the postscript by pointing out that um, you know the North North Carolina, the, the Raleigh Durham area, is co almost completely shaped by really powerful state entities, right? You had the Triangle Research Park in the 1950s, right? You have the state highway programs. You have the two of the largest employers, UNC and uh, NC State. Right? You have the state park system is really quite good. I think people like that. In North Carolina, and I could go on and on, but there, you know, there are these enormous impacts, and it's not just while I use Rockefeller in part because he's just a great example of the great stories, also of why things did and didn't work. Plus, the Rockefeller archives close to my house, so that was also very good. I'll admit that that's a good thing. But um, but when you start looking broadly, whether it's North Carolina or Florida or other places like that, you see that states are this sort of quiet but really powerful role in both center city development, suburban development, and even regional scale. Infrastructure. All right, I did it. It's a tough, a tough time. All right, yeah. Questions? There are um, maybe limiting myself to New York State. I apologize, but there are so That's many okay. um, places that have lost their industrial base. You know, Newburgh, Troy. Sure. The so list is endless. And it seems like what's happening is, as they implode, they get backfilled by state entities, mm -hmm. uh, colleges, mm -hmm. and, and recently community colleges, mm -hmm. and healthcare. So the, high, the largest employer in the town is no longer Kodak or right. whatever, it's, it's a state entity. Are, are, are local areas becoming too dependent on the state? Are they expecting the state to bail them out and plan for, and meanwhile, the well, state they are. Itself, I mean, whether they expect or not, if you look at the major work that's being done around city planning in New York State right now, the Empire State Development Corporation is like the long-term planning. They have the money. I mean, most of these cities don't have the cash. That, so the ESCC has both the professional planning staff, but they also have access to the various uh, carrots, right, to encourage development. You know, uh, it's early in the process, maybe. I mean, there are a lot of questions about whether these things are sustainable. Um, I think a lot of the center city stuff is a little less sustainable or very often than what you mentioned, like the hospitals and the universities and so forth. But I mean, I, I tend to see it as a, um, I mean, it's a mutual, the relationship between states and smaller cities is crucial, not just in New York, but other cities as well. Um, and they are often reliant, for instance, I mean, you could argue that a lot of the extra profit that's thrown off in New York City, there wouldn't be that money for these kinds of speculative kind of development programs, if not for, um, you know, the enormous profits generated in New York City. You know, most states have sort of the, the winner areas, right? And that the states basically can operate as a kind of regional, you know, equalizer, right? Um, and of course, the people in the rich cities don't like it, I know, you know, things like that, because they have enormous needs themselves. Right? But I would encourage people to go to Newark or Syracuse or other cities and sort of see the situation there. It may seem like, well, there, you know, it's a, it's a waste of money, you know, a lot of people say, or these other programs, but, you know, there, there's a case to be made for this kind of leveraging of state resources for upstate cities. Yeah? Um, yet on Sunday, there was a, a program at the Public Theater about democracy and our, you know, what it means to us in the cities. And sure. one of the items that we're talking about is the development that was going on in the West, uh, the Hudson Yards. Mm -hmm. And one of the speakers was saying that I was, couldn't believe that. Uh, private entity to get so much uh, control over how it was planned out. And their comment with UDC, they, they had the control of the, that development and, uh, and also uh, Atlantic Yards and possibly I think there's, there's a discussing <coughs> side side yards as well. Is that, can, can you describe a little bit about how you know, they're, they don't have they don't have to abide by local uh, well, input? Well, right, so them. as part of the creation of the UDC, there's the ability to basically Override the zoning and other things like that. Although, let's face it, it's not exactly the case that they're just overriding everything. There are a lot of players who are basically supportive of this, right? We can look at the Amazon deal, 
for instance, is a very clear example where a local, a local power broker, the mayor, uh, basically um, more or less was a partner right, in this kind of leveraging of state assets and also willing to go along in order to avoid a drawn out, what they thought was a drawn out public process uh, to, this, uh, to, to work with the state entity. And I think that's pretty typical of a lot, and that's actually fairly typical not just in, for instance, um, the, you know, the, the corporate side of it, but for instance, convention centers, um, stadiums, things like that. Uh, increasingly, one reason the state has come in for convention centers uh, nationally and also um, um, stadiums is that the public doesn't want to pay for them. Like you should bring up, like they, they, there are there were increasing numbers of rejections of bond issues, local bond issues for the financing of, let's say, a sports stadium. Well, they realized, you know, a lot of inner city people realized this is not something that I'm going to benefit from. So more or less, the response of the sort of the local elite, but also a state aligned elite, the owners and so forth, has basically been to use a state authority to circumvent a uh, local review process, a local financing process, etc. So I don't, I think the agencies are partners in a lot of these projects, uh, because not, not as sort of outsiders or something like that, but as part of a kind of, what we call again, the urban growth machine, whatever it is. It's, yeah. In a lot of the uh, smaller rural states, there wasn't the political will to rebuild the cities. Um, but the way they got around that was to t by tapping into federal money. Yes. So then they could say, we're not using state money right. to do all this investment. What were some of those federal programs that came about after World War II that really gave uh, a lot of the, sure. the money available for urban renewal? Well, uh, the, the Title I program of the Housing Act of 1949 was crucial in providing basically two-thirds of the cost of site acquisition uh, for local authorities, redevelopment, or, or state charter redevelopment authorities to do their work. Um, public housing was a big program uh, that basically paid for, on a federal level, for this kind of redevelopment. Um, the Interstate Highway uh, Act, 56 and so forth, uh, that paid for a lot of the development. Uh, the, basically, there are a whole series of transit-oriented acts, basically, that paid for um, capital. First, in the 1960s, uh, they, they covered some of the capital costs of renewing mass transit. All right? um, and then, by the early 70s, partly because New York was still running the red so badly, you also get operating subsidies from the federal government for mass transit. So basically, and also the environmental side, too. So by the way, the asterisks, right, you know, it's like, it's a big one, you know, about federal participation. Uh, in uh, basically uh, state authorities um, and these kinds of redevelopment programs. It was crucial as a pastor. So yeah, basically there's not a state that doesn't want, even a rural state, right, which doesn't want to give anything to its cities. They're going to line up, right, if there's money coming out of the federal government for their share. Like you can look at Mass Transit. It's a classic, oh, 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 we'll, we'll do buses. You know, we're not going to do rapid. You know, the, the federal transit program is to save New York and a few other big cities, right, with rapid transit. But, you know, some other states doesn't have rapid transit, but suddenly they're going to go out and buy buses. They're going to take over like a failing private transit system. They're going to buy a bunch of buses because the federal government's going to pay for it. But what they often find, of course, is that, you know, we find that in New York, certainly, but they find everywhere is that the federal funds are insufficient to run the system. Right? So then they have to create regional payroll taxes. Well, there are quite a few ways that funding is done for um, regional transportation. So it's kind of similar to the roads, which is the federal government comes, wants to come in and build it all, and then when you actually look at who's funding like maintenance of this stuff over time, it's often state and local governments is paying the lion's share of maintenance. The federal government wants to pay for new, right? Very rarely they want to pay for maintenance. Good question. Um, first of all, thank you. It's a fabulous talk. Um, I have a question about the Title I characteristics of, of state governments or structures or uh, the base of residents um, that you think will um, set the stage for certain states to be leaders in terms of climate change going forward? And that's what yeah. Well, I mean, the, 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 the most, or, I, I, I didn't do the chart, but probably the ones that are more urbanized, I don't know, you'd have to probably, I think it probably works out, the, the percentage of urbanization or metropolitan residents seem to be the ones like California and New York and, and others, but I wouldn't rule out other states necessarily, but I, would, I think that, 
where you have, for instance, a very large city, a very dominant city, potentially. But, I mean, you can look at Texas has become very urbanized, but they're not really. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know if yeah. I can generalize, like, <laughs> Florida, you know, is very urbanized, but, you know, there, there are, I, I do think there's an element of the, the importance of leadership here, you know, who's there, um, the demographic factors, so there are a lot of Yeah, just history here, uh, you obviously know more about that. My sense is states were, didn't have very large governments. They didn't right. really play right. a very big role. <coughs> yeah. But through this period, all of a sudden, the bureaucracy of the mm -hmm. whole Yeah, I, didn't, I, I, I do stress that in the book. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot on, I mean, yeah, state governments were relatively small. That's why, for instance, their capital complexes were relatively small. Right? Um, there was also, there were, there were ways in which state legislatures had been set up, we can talk about, you know, state legislatures are key, right, where basically the rural areas had uh, basically a much larger say, there are a series of decisions which are really crucial to basically restoring one man, one vote sort of situations. Um, so yeah, state government was small, mostly it's responsibility of some roads, some mental hospitals, I mean, there's one of the key sources I use for this is an entire sort of bookshelf full of what's called the Book of the States. And it really gives you a very good idea of all the activities, what state governments are up to. It's a wonderful, if you're ever looking for a compendium of what's, and you know, it starts out, it's like, there, there aren't a lot of activities, you know, that they are engaged in, in any big way. Even their state university systems were small, right? They're relatively small systems. So they become, they, definitely there's a, just a tremendous change in scale uh, post-war, and I guess it's the demands. Yeah, just just a comment on that, but that's in tandem with the federal government. Absolutely, uh, the, the asterisk, the, the mind, asterisk right? there. Yeah, whether it's yeah, federal yeah. regulations which require, yeah. for instance, that, or federal funds which help pay yeah. for it. But I would point out, for instance, let's talk about state universities, right? We also have the GI Bill, right? right. As this sort of that's the watershed. That's why you get big state universities. Well, actually, you know, Brown in California, you know, Rockefeller here. When you look at the kind of money. Uh, that basically was borrowed, um, basically a revenue bond basis to pay for this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Who's calling the shots? Who's deciding where these campuses are? We think of it as like normal. Oh, of course you put the, the amount of stuff in front of them. You know, there's a lot of decisions about where campuses are going to be, how big they're going to be, right? Some states like New York decided we're going for it, right? We want a system of a quarter million people, right? We're more, right? So that's, but other states did not. Right, but, but, it's, but, yeah. but I think that is the feds let the state, I mean, like yeah. the federal system lets the states make a lot of those. The yeah. federal government doesn't actually have a lot of employees aside from the military that actually right. do anything that they regulate. A lot of the state enterprises, yeah. I, I think there's a, uh, there's a an important difference between the federal government and the asterisks that that needs to be brought out and may have brought it out in the book, which is that with very few exceptions, the federal, the expansion of state government activity in, in many of these areas that you describe, I suspect is very much tied to the expansion, the post-war expansion of federal government's mm -hmm. own activity, but most importantly, the feds directed the money to the states, yeah. not the cities, with very yeah. few exceptions. And that empowered states, not using it, mm -hmm. their own money many times, to provide for their constituents in a magnanimous way. I would agree, and in fact, the, but the other, and the other side of it is that as these state programs, which ran kind of really fast and got really big, yeah. like for instance the water program, right? They go to DC when they realize, oh my God, you know, like this thing is going to kill us, right? The cost mounted so fast, right, that then they run to DC and they basically, you know, are part of the coalition, right, that gets basically federal regulations and funds to pay for it. So I do think there is the regulatory dimension that's building and the pass through dimension of states, but also, you know, you can even look at SUNY, like, you know, the massive financial aid programs are basically an operating subsidy for state mm -hmm. universities. I mean, you can look at it however you want, right? But in essence, you can argue that that's what it is, you know, that without the federal government's, uh, <laughs> you know, um, the student loan programs, you couldn't run SUNY or CUNY at this point, I would think, right? So, so there's, a, there's a, I would say that, yeah, it is coming from the feds, but there's a kind of interrelationship where the ambition of certain states basically drives some of this like, oh, we need more money. Like, how can we figure out how to basically, you know, get these funds? That's a good question.
Other questions? From my students, perhaps? <laughs> Very quiet. <laughs> extra credit. They know, they know that I'm not serious about extra credit. I told them the secret. I told them the secret. You give it the extra credit, and then you can take it away. But no, you get it. Do you have any questions? That's more than I thought. We have a reception as well as we have this here, which Nick had to drag down from his own personal uh, cash. So I'm sure he would be delighted to want to purchase a book and bring it to the front of the store and then bring it back. Yeah, yes. Please don't make me share the book. But, um, <laughs> but there is wine and water over there, and um, for the one of many first ladies in the exhibition, yes. Your, your role has been taken, but I encourage you for extra credit to see the show. Yes. <laughs> like what's happening is as they implode, they get backfilled by state entities, mm -hmm. uh, colleges mm -hmm. and, and recently community colleges mm -hmm. and healthcare. So the high the largest employer in the town is no longer Kodak or right. whatever. It's, it's a state entity. Are are our local areas becoming too dependent on the state? Are they expecting the state to they have a matter of plan for any of us. Well, they are. I mean, whether they expect or not, if you look at the major work that's being done around city planning in New York State right now, 
the Empire State Development Corporation is like the long-term planning. They have the money. I mean, most of these cities don't have the cash. The, so the ESCC has both the professional planning staff, but they also have access to the various uh, carrots, right, to encourage development. You know, uh, it's early in the process, maybe. I mean, there are a lot of questions about whether these things are sustainable. Um, I think a lot of the center city stuff is a little less sustainable very often than what you mentioned, like the hospitals and the universities and so forth. But, I mean, I, I tend to see it as a, um, I mean, it's a mutual, the relationship between states and smaller cities is crucial, not just in New York, but other cities as well. Um, and they are often reliant, for instance, I mean, you could argue that a lot of the extra profit that's thrown off in New York City, there wouldn't be that money for these kinds of speculative kind of development programs if not for um, you know, the enormous profits generated in New York City. You know, most states have sort of the, the winner areas, right? And that the states basically can operate as a kind of regional you know, equalizer, right? Um, and of course, the people in the rich cities don't like it, I know, you know, things like that, because they have enormous needs themselves. Right? But I would encourage people to go to Newark or Syracuse or other cities and sort of see the situation there. It may seem like, well, there, you know, it's a, it's a waste of money, you know, a lot of people say, or these other programs, but, you know, there, there's a case to be made for this kind of leveraging of state resources for upstate cities. Yeah? Um, yeah, on Sunday there was a, a program at the public theater about democracy and our, you know, what it means to us in the cities. And sure. one of the items that we're talking about is the development that was going on in the West, uh, the Hudson Yards. Mm -hmm. And one of the speakers was saying that was, couldn't believe that, uh, you know, private entity would get so much uh, control over how it was planned out. And their comment with UDC, they, they had the control of the, that development and, uh, and also Atlantic yards and possibly I think there's, there's a discussing side side of yards as well. Is that can you describe a little bit about how you know they're they don't have they don't have to abide by local uh, well input. right so as part of the creation of the UBC there's the ability to basically override the zoning and other things like that. Although let's face it, it's not exactly the case that they're just overriding everything. There are a lot of players who are basically supportive of this, right? We can look at the Amazon deal, for instance, is a very clear example where local, a local power broker, the mayor, uh, basically um, more or less was a partner, right, in this kind of leveraging of state assets and also willing to go along in order to avoid a drawn out, what they thought was a drawn out public process uh, to, this, uh, to, to work with the state entity. And I think that's pretty typical of a lot, and that's actually fairly typical not just in, for instance, um, the you know, the, the corporate side of it, but for instance, convention centers, um, stadiums, things like that. Uh, increasingly, one reason the state has come in for convention centers uh, nationally and also um, um, stadiums is that the public doesn't want to pay for them. Like, you should bring up, like, they, they, there, are, there were increasing numbers of rejections of bond issues, local bond issues, for the financing of, let's say, a sports stadium. Well, they realize, you know, a lot of inner city people realize, this is not something that I'm going to benefit from. So more or less the response of the sort of the local elite, but also a state-aligned elite, the owners and so forth, has basically been to use a state authority to circumvent a uh, local review process, a local financing process, et cetera. So I don't, I think the agencies are partners in a lot of these projects. Uh, because, not, not as sort of outsiders or something like that, but as part of a kind of, you might call it, again, the urban growth machine, whatever it is. Yeah. And along a lot of the uh, smaller rural states, there wasn't the political will to rebuild the cities. Um, but the way they got around that was to, by tapping into federal money, yes. so then they could say, we're not using state money right. to do all this investment. What were some of those federal programs that came about after World War II that really gave uh, a lot of the, sure. the money available for urban renewal? Well, uh, the, the Title I program of the Housing Act of 1949 was crucial in providing basically two-thirds of the cost of site acquisition uh, for local authorities, redevelopment, or, or state charter redevelopment authorities to do their work. Um, public housing was a big program uh, that basically paid for, on a federal level, for this kind of redevelopment. 
Um, the Interstate Highway uh, Act of 56 and so forth, uh, that paid for a lot of the development. Um, the, basically, there are a whole series of transit-oriented acts, basically, that paid for um, capital. First, in the 1960s, uh, they, they covered some of the capital costs of renewing mass transit. All right. um, and then by the early 70s, partly because New York was still running the red so badly, you also get operating subsidies from the federal government for mass transit. So basically, and also the environmental side too. So by the way, <coughs> asterisks, right? You know, it's like it's a big one. You know, about federal participation uh, in uh, basically uh, state authorities um, and these kinds of redevelopment programs. It was crucial as a pastor. So yeah, basically, there's not a state that doesn't want, even a rural state, right, which doesn't want to give anything to its cities. They're going to line up, right? If there's money coming out of the federal government for their share, like you can look at Mass Transit. It's a classic. Oh, oh, oh. We'll we'll do buses. You know, we're not going to do rapid. You know, the the federal transit program is to save New York and a few other big cities, right, with rapid transit. But you know, some other states doesn't have rapid transit, but suddenly they're going to go out and buy buses. They're going to take over like a failing private transit system. They're going to buy a bunch of buses because the federal government's going to pay for it. But what they often find, of course, is that. You know, we find that in New York, certainly, but they find everywhere is that the federal funds are insufficient to run the system, right? So then they have to create regional payroll taxes. Well, there are quite a few ways of funding is done for um, regional transportation. So it's kind of similar to the roads, which is the federal government constantly wants to come in and build it all, and then when you actually look at who's funding like maintenance of this stuff over time, it's often state and local governments is paying the lion's share of maintenance. The federal government wants to pay for new, right? Very rarely they want to pay for maintenance. Good question. Um, first of all, thank you for the fabulous talk. Um, are there any certain characteristics of, of state governments or structures or uh, the base of residents um, that you think will um, set the stage for certain states to be leaders in terms of climate change going forward? And that's what well, I mean, the, 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 the most, er, I, I, I didn't do the chart, but probably the ones that are more urbanized, I don't know, you'd have to probably, I think it probably works out, the, the percentage of urbanization or metropolitan residents seem to be the ones like California and New York and, and others, but I wouldn't rule out other states necessarily, but I, would, I think that where you have, for instance, a very large city, very dominant city, potentially, I mean, you can look at Texas has become very urbanized, but they're not really. So, you know, I don't know if yeah. I can generalize, yeah. like, Florida, you know, is very organized, but, you know, there, there are, I, I do think there's an element of the, the importance of leadership here, you know, who's there, um, with demographic factors, so there are a lot of them. Mark? Just, history here, you obviously know more about it, but my sense is states were, didn't have very large governments. They didn't right. really play a right. very big <coughs> role. Yeah. But through this period, all of a sudden, the bureaucracy, the mm -hmm. whole yeah, I did. I, I do stress that in the book. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot on. I mean, yeah, state governments were relatively small. That's why, for instance, their capital complexes were relatively small. Right. Um, there was also there were there were ways in which state legislatures had been set up. We talk about, you know state legislatures are key, right? Where basically the rural areas had. Uh, basically a much larger say, and there are a series of decisions which are really mm -hmm. crucial to basically restoring one man, one vote sort of situations. Um, so yeah, state government was small, mostly it's responsibility of some roads, some mental hospitals. I mean, there's one of the key sources I use for this is an entire sort of bookshelf full of what's called the Book of the States. And it, it really gives you a very good idea of all the activities, what state governments are up to. It's a wonderful, if you're ever looking for a compendium, what's, and you know, it starts out, it's like, there aren't a lot of activities, you know, that they are engaged in in any big way. Even their state university systems were small, right? They're relatively small systems, so they become they definitely there's a, just a tremendous change in scale uh, post war, and I guess it's the demands. Yeah, just just to comment on that, but that's in tandem with the federal government. Absolutely, the, federal government. Uh, the, the asterisk, federal government is the, the asterisk right? there. Yeah, whether it's yeah, federal yeah. regulations which require, yeah. for instance, that or federal funds which help pay for it. But I would point out, for instance, let's talk about state universities, right? We also have the GI Bill, right? right? As the sort of that's the watershed. That's why you get big state universities. Well, actually, you know, Brown in California, you know, Rockefeller here. When you look at the kind of money. Uh, that basically was borrowed, um, basically a revenue bond basis to pay for this stuff, right? Who's calling the shots? Who's deciding where these campuses are? 
We think of it as like normal. Oh, of course you put the, the mouse on the plane. Look at them. You know, there's a lot of decisions about where camps are going to be, how big they're going to be, right? Some states like New York decided we're going for it, right? We want a system of a quarter million people, right? Or more, right? So that's, but other states did not. Right, that, that's, but, yeah. but I think that is the feds let the state, I mean, like, yeah. the federal system lets the states make a lot of those. The yeah. federal government doesn't actually have a lot of employees aside from the military that do right. anything that they regulate. A lot of the state enterprises, yeah. yeah. I, I think there's, a, uh, there's a, an important element to the asterisks that that needs to be brought out, and may have brought it out in the book, which is that with very few exceptions, the federal, the expansion of state government activity in, in many of these areas that you described, I suspect is very much tied to the expansion, the post-war expansion of federal government's mm -hmm. own activity, but most importantly, the feds directed the money to the states, yeah. not the cities, with very yeah. few exceptions. And that empowered states, not using it, mm -hmm. their own money many times, to provide for their constituents in a magnanimous way. I would agree. And in fact, the, uh, but the, other, and the other side of it is that as these state programs, which ran kind of really fast and got really big, yeah. like for instance the water program, right? They go to DC when they realize, oh my God, you know, like, this thing is going to kill us, right? <coughs> the cost mounted so fast, right, that then they run to DC and they basically, you know, are part of the coalition, right, that gets basically federal regulations and funds to pay for it. So I do think there is the regulatory dimension that's building and the pass through dimension of states, but also, you know, you can even look at SUNY, like, you know, the massive financial aid programs. Are basically an operating subsidy for state mm -hmm. universities. I mean, you can look at it however you want, right? But in essence, you can argue that that's what it is. You know, that without the federal government's, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, student loan programs, you couldn't run SUNY or CUNY at this point. I would think, right? So, so there's a, there's a. I would say that yeah, it is coming from the feds, but there's a kind of interrelationship where the ambition of certain states basically drives some of this. Like, oh, we need more money. Like, how can we figure out how to basically, you know, get these funds? That's a good question. Other questions? For my students, perhaps? <laughs> Very quiet. <laughs> extra credit. They know, they know that I'm not serious about extra credit. I told them the secret. I told them the secret. You give it the extra credit, and then you could take it. Away. But no, you get it. Do you have any questions? That's more than I think. Hi, um, welcome. I'm uh, Carol Willis. I'm the founder, director, and curator of the Skyscraper Museum. And I know that a bunch of you are, uh, are probably new to this space anyway. I know that you're Nick's students from NYU, so welcome. I hope you look around the exhibition uh, before, you, before you leave. And uh, anybody else new tonight to the museum? Um, good, welcome. Uh, we do book talks once a month, and we're, um, I'll, I'll introduce Nick and, oh, there it is, he's kind of bathroom around the corner. Uh, on topics that have to do with uh, skyscrapers, uh, New, York, uh, New York and international, on New York City history, on urban history, on all aspects of urbanism. And um, so we invite you to look at our website and certainly become a member if that's of interest to you. We, uh, this is the, these are the last two weeks for this particular exhibition, which is called Skyline, uh, and it's about the history of the New York skyline over about 145 years and the significant periods uh, into which it can be divided and the economic, technological, and regulatory forces that shape the, shape the skyline over time. Uh, that's the kind of thing we do. We try to find kind of big sweeping ideas that explain uh, trajectories of, of urban development and we also like to look in detail and through historical research at very singular topics and uh, these are the last two weeks before our next show which happens to be curated by Nick Bloom uh, as well as Matt Altwicker from both from NY both professors uh, at least currently Nick a professor at a New, York, New York Institute of Technology uh, let's see I better do a, a, a more focused uh, biography uh, of the Nick, um, and when I do that specific introduction, but I, I just want to mention 
that the exhibition uh, is really a drill down on housing, and we'll talk about Nick's specialization within um, public housing as a topic, uh, and uh, the, and it, it's called Housing Density from Tenements to Towers, and so it's a bit of a uh, kind of uh, trajectory, well, a kind of tangent from our usual topics of skyscrapers, kind of com the commercial skyline, to look at residential and the development over time from the late 19th century until um, really the 1970s, but with uh, implications for the present day on um, uh, controversies like developing over NYCHA's uh, um, low-density land. So, uh, so I've, I've had the pleasure of working with Nick and Matt for about a year and a half now in developing the ideas for, for that exhibition. And it's really been a delight. And so my introduction for him is going to be more of a personal one than a professional academic one. But I did want to hold up, not just the current book that you're here, that he's, he's really debuting tonight because it's public, pub date, I think, is even next week rather than this week. Uh, but um, some of the many books on housing that he's been responsible for are uh, co-producing, co-editing, uh, but writing much of affordable housing in New York, which was also done in conjunction with an exhibition and with Matt Lasner at Hunter. Uh, uh, the book Public Housing That Worked about NYCHA and a whole series of other ones that I thought I'd put on a post-it here somewhere uh, that were published in Nick's Annus Mirabile, which was 2015, when uh, four of his, how many books now? Like 10 books or so? Nine. Nine books, four of his nine books were published. Four, four or five in 2015, which include the public housing that worked, this affordable housing book, the public housing myth, uh, branching out the Metropolitan Airport uh, for uh, JFK in modern New York and a whole series of topics that place these in-depth histories in, a, in a, a broader context of urban development, of state, local, and federal development um, that brings me to how states shaped post-war America. And since we've only just uh, kind of unpacked this book, I mean literally unpacked it, <laughs> not in an intellectual sense, but just taken it out of the bag uh, uh, today, uh, we'll, we'll get to hear him explain a, a thesis uh, of the kind of underdeveloped, or under, the under-argued narrative of the role of states uh, versus federal and local in the, in the shaping of urban America. So have to, um, time to do, he, he will do that for us. And uh, there are other books that I can mention, but I just want to say that it's been such a pleasure to work on, with Nick uh, on, on developing a set of ideas, because he's somebody who really cares deeply about ideas as well as about history. And um, the, the kind of uh, e excitement that comes from kind of discovering things and of D discovery through thinking and writing that makes uh, clear the amount of, kind of literal production of words that, that he's able to do that is, is really truly extraordinary for somebody of his, uh, um, of his youth, let's put it that way. And uh, I'm happy to announce for him that he has an exciting new position. So after the end of this semester at New York Institute of Technology, he'll be going to um, Hunter College in order to be a professor there in the Urban Studies program. So uh, many people have, have recognized how prolific and how um, intelligent his analysis of urban is, and we look forward to all the production that he'll do um, there uh, about New York, as well as about post-war America. And My mother would be delighted. Okay. <laughs> so, here's <laughs> <laughs>